Mr. Disley stopped dead. Fear flooded him. He looked back at the whisperers as if he wanted to say something to them, but thought better of it. He dashed back across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him. Seized his telephone and had almost finished dialing his home number when he changed his mind. He put the receiver back down and stroked his mustache, thinking. No, he was being stupid. Potter wasn't such an unusual name. He was sure there were lots of people called Potter who had a son called Harry. Come to think of it, he wasn't even sure his nephew was called Harry. He'd never even seen the boy. It might have been Harvey. Or Harold. There was no point in worrying M.R.S. Disley, she always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her if he'd had a sister like that, but all the same, those people in cloaks. He found it a lot harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon, and when he left the building at five o'clock. He was still so worried that he walked straight into someone just outside the door. Sorry, he grunted, as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell. It was a few seconds before Mr. Disley realized that the man. A wide smile and he said in a squeaky voice that made passers-by stare don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who has gone at last. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating, this happy happy day. And the old man hugged Mr. Disley around the middle and walked off. Mr. Disley stood rooted to the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He also thought he had been called a muggle, whatever that was. He was rattled. He hurried to his car and set off home, hoping he was imagining things, which he had never hoped before, because he didn't approve of imagination. As he pulled into the driveway of number four, the first thing he saw and it didn't improve his mood was the tabby cat he'd spotted that morning. It was now sitting on his garden wall. He was sure it was the same one, it had the same markings around its eyes. Shoo, said Mr. Disley loudly. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern look. Was this normal cat behavior, Mr. Disley wondered. Trying to pull himself together, he let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. M.R.S. Disley had had a nice, normal day. She told him over dinner all about M.R.S. next door's problems with her daughter and how Dudley had learned a new word shan't. Mr. Disley tried to act normally. When Dudley had been put to bed, he went into the living room in time to catch the last report on the evening news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported that the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Although owls normally hunt at night and are hardly ever seen in daylight, there have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying in every direction since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping pattern. The newsreader allowed himself a grin. Most mysterious. And now, over to Jim McGuffin with the weather. Going to be any more showers of owls tonight, Jim. Well, Ted, said the weatherman, I don't know about that, but it's not only the owls that have been acting oddly today. Viewers as far apart as Kent, Yorkshire and Dundee have been phoning in. Celebrating bonfire night early it's not until next week, folks. But I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Disley sat frozen in his armchair. Shooting stars all over Britain? Owls flying by daylight? Mysterious people in cloaks all over the place? And a whisper, a whisper about the potters. M.R.S. Disley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He'd have to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. E.R. Petunia, dear you haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he had expected, M.R.S. Disley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister.
No, she said sharply. Why? Funny stuff on the news, Mr. Disley mumbled. Owls. Shooting stars. And there were a lot of funny looking people in town today. So, snapped M.R.S. Disley. Well, I just thought, maybe, it was something to do with. You know, her lot. M.R.S. Disley sipped her tea through pursed lips. Mr. Disley wondered whether he dared tell her he'd heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare. Instead he said, as casually as he could, their son he'd be about Dudley's age now, wouldn't he? I suppose so, said M.R.S. Disley stiffly. What's his name again? Howard, isn't it? Harry. Nasty, common name, if you ask me. Oh, yes, said Mr. Disley, his heart sinking horribly. Yes, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. While M.R.S. Disley was in the bathroom, Mr. Disley crept to the bedroom window and peered down into the front garden. The cat was still there. It was staring down Privet Drive as though it was waiting for something. Was he imagining things? Could all this have anything to do with the Potters? If it did, if it got out that they were related to a pair of well, he didn't think he could bear it. The Disleys got into bed. M.R.S. Disley fell asleep quickly but Mr. Disley lay awake, turning it all over in his mind. His last, comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if they... Petunia thought about them and their kind. He couldn't see how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect them. How very wrong he was. Mr. Disley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no sign of sleepiness. It was sitting as still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of Privet Drive. It didn't so much as quiver when a car door slammed in the next street, nor when two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner the cat had been watching, appeared so suddenly and silently you'd have thought he'd just popped out of the ground. The cat's tail twitched and its eyes narrowed. Nothing like this man had ever been seen in Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak which swept the ground and high-heeled, buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright, and sparkling behind half-moon spectacles and his nose was very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore didn't seem to realize that he had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging in his cloak, looking for something. But he did seem to realize he was being watched, because he looked up suddenly at the cat. Which was still staring at him from the other end of the street. For some reason, the sight of the cat seemed to amuse him. He chuckled and muttered, I should have known. He had found what he was looking for in his inside pocket. It seemed to be a silver cigarette lighter. He flicked it open, held it up in the air and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop. He clicked it again the next lamp flickered into darkness. Twelve times he clicked the put outer, until the only lights left in the whole street were two tiny pinpricks in the distance. Which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out of their window now, even beady-eyed M.R.S. Disley. His cloak and set off down the street towards number four, where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment he spoke to it. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at the tabby, but it had gone. 
Instead he was smiling at a rather severe looking woman who was wearing square glasses exactly the shape of the markings the cat had had around its eyes. She, too, was wearing a cloak, an emerald one. Her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctly ruffled. How did you know it was me, she asked. My dear professor, I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. You'd be stiff if you'd been sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day. When you could have been celebrating. I must have passed a dozen feasts and parties on my way here. Professor McGonagall sniffed angrily. Oh yes, everyone's celebrating, all right, she said impatiently. You'd think they'd be a bit more careful, but no even the muggles have noticed some things going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back at the Disley's dark living room window. I heard it. Flocks of owls. Shooting stars. Well, they're not completely stupid. They were bound to notice something. Shooting stars down in Kent I'll bet that was Daedalus Diggle. He never had much sense. You can't blame them, said Dumbledore gently. We've had precious little to celebrate for eleven years. I know that, said Professor McGonagall irritably. But that's no reason to lose our heads. People are being downright careless, out on the streets in broad daylight, not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumors. She threw a sharp, sideways glance at Dumbledore here, as though hoping he was going to tell her something, but he didn't so she went on. A fine thing it would be if, on the very day you know who seems to have disappeared at last, the muggles found out about us all. I suppose he really has gone, Dumbledore. It certainly seems so, said Dumbledore. We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a sherbet lemon? A what? No, thank you said Professor McGonagall coldly, as though she didn't think this was the moment for sherbet lemons. As I say, even if you know who has gone. My dear Professor, surely a sensible person like yourself can call him by his name? All this you know who nonsense for eleven years I have been trying to persuade people to call him by his proper name. V-O-L-D-E-M-O-R-T Professor McGonagall flinched, but Dumbledore who was unsticking two sherbet lemons, seemed not to notice. It all gets so confusing if we keep saying you know who dot. I have never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. I know you haven't, said Professor McGonagall, sounding half exasperated, half admiring. But you're different. Everyone knows you're the only one you know oh, all right, Voldemort was frightened of. You flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I will never have. Only because you are too well noble to use them. It's lucky it's dark. I haven't blushed so much since Madame Pomfret told me she liked my new earmuffs. Professor McGonagall shot a sharp look at Dumbledore and said, The owls are nothing to the rumors that are flying around. You know what everyone's saying? About why he's disappeared. About what finally stopped him. It seemed that Professor McGonagall had reached the point she was most anxious to discuss, the real reason she had been waiting on a cold hard wall all day. For neither as a cat nor as a woman had she fixed Dumbledore with such a piercing stare as she did now. It was plain that whatever everyone was saying, she was not going to believe it until Dumbledore told her it was true. Dumbledore, however, was choosing another sherbet lemon and did not answer. What they're saying, she pressed on, is that last night Voldemort turned up in Godric's Hollow. He went to find the Potters. The rumor is that Lily and James Potter are are that they're dead. Dumbledore bowed his head. Professor McGonagall gasped. Lily and James. I can't believe it. 